Okay, uh, welcome back to week seven, Americana, Cultural Phenomena in Contemporary American Society. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the 1970s, and this is from the uh, peopleshistory.com. Uh, so um, what happened in 1970? Uh, Some uh, key events, uh, technology, and uh, popular culture. So just as a financial reference, uh, what did things cost back then? So a new house uh, would have been about $25,000. So if you add another zero to that, today, the average cost of a new house uh, in America is about $250,000. So the average uh, income uh, per year is a little under $10,000. And uh, rent, if you wanted to rent an apartment, it would be about $140. And an average cost of a very inexpensive new American car would be a little under $2,000. But I'm going to talk about a, a car called the uh, Blackhawk. And it's a, an American ultra luxury car uh, manufactured from 1971 to the mid uh, 80s. And the first uh, Blackhawk was sold, uh, was purchased by Elvis Presley in 1970 for about $26,000. So that was big money back then. But as we can see through the 70s, uh, American car manufacturing has new competition. And uh, that comes from Japan. And it has to do with uh, oil, the price of gas, quality of car, and so forth. So, that's a little bit, uh, a little further into it. This is from carthrottle.com. The article goes on to say that the 70s were arguably the biggest transitional period for American car culture. Muscle cars, so little cars with big engines and drinks a lot of gas, but goes really fast, nearly went extinct, and there was a surge of foreign cars into the country. The first major blow to American cars was the oil embargo of 1973, and we're going to talk about the effects of that a little later. After months of fuel shortages and high gas prices, it woke Americans up to how much fuel they were using. From that point on, fuel efficiency would become more and more important to car buyers over the years. The next big hit was emissions laws, which made car manufacturers strap emission equipment to their vehicles and that reduced horsepower. Foreign car makers took advantage of this sad situation to sell more of their cars to the American public, especially from Japan. At the beginning of the 70s, Honda, Datsun, and Toyota were just starting to sell significant numbers of cars to the U.S., but that continued on for many years. Uh, including up to today. So one of the big new uh, inventions in uh, cars was something called the eight 
track stereo player. And to buy a new one back then was about a little under $40. So this was the new edition for music uh, in the car. And uh, we'll move on to our next slide from here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the beginning of uh, Starbucks. And we did talk about this uh, earlier, but uh, we'll uh, take it from a different point of view in this slide. Uh, this is from uh, Coronecrates, uh, wordpress.com. Um, and it's uh, written by a, an employee of the uh, Starbucks company. Now, when you are a employee of Starbucks behind the counter, you are called a barista. And a barista is someone who is knowledgeable all things coffee. So uh, this author, uh, no name given, uh, has been a uh, barista at Starbucks for six years. And she goes on to say, welcome to Starbucks. I've been a barista at Starbucks for six years. Since I work for a pop culture icon, I am able to see several examples of pop culture every day. Here are a few. Advertising. What do you think of when you hear the word Starbucks? Most likely you would think of the white paper cup with the pretty green mermaid on the side. This lovely lady is called a siren. She has been charged over the years uh, and changed, but she has uh, become the international symbol of Starbucks. This uh, advertising is spread uh, whenever someone takes their latte to the office carries a frappuccino to school, or Instagrams their beautiful triple tall vanilla non-fat no foam 180 degree mocha. The Starbucks siren is widespread advertising that has made Starbucks coffee company millions of dollars. And it's true, you see these cups uh, everywhere from the office, to the boardroom, to the classroom. Technology. Within the past few years, my job as a barista has changed because of current technology regarding Starbucks cards. So initially, they gave you something that looked like a credit card, like um, you had so much money in it and you would pay your coffee using their in-house uh, credit card system. Uh, there are customers that still pay with physical Starbucks cards, but the newest smartphone apps allow customers to simply let the barista scan their phone to pay for their order. And this is at least five years old now. This is just one example of how Starbucks has been able to adapt and change with current trends and culture to stay relevant. Using an app instead of a card is trendy. It's happening now and it's really fun too. And it's really convenient. Social behavior. Starbucks has played a key role in changing pop culture in the past 20 years by actually changing how we meet and spend time with one another. Starbucks has made it cool to meet for coffee. Starbucks is the trendy place to spend your time studying. My Starbucks store has a conference room. 
So Starbucks is now the fun place to hold your business meeting. And I have to admit, I love being part of those awkward first dates that I see all the time. Starbucks is first date central, and that is so true. These things may seem small after all. It's just a logo and an app and a cup of coffee. However, Starbucks is a global company with more than 100,000 stores, thousands of faithful employees, and millions of loyal customers. Though its effect on advertising, technology, food, music, social behavior, and economics, Starbucks is changing pop culture. Okay, so that's a little bit on Starbucks. Okay, so on this slide here, we're going to talk about um, a continuation from the 60s. And that is the uh, space program. So uh, America has sent a few flights up to the moon and back. I think there were seven all together that they sent. Um, but during uh, Apollo 13, uh, a major accident occurred. So the Apollo 13 mission launches as the third mission to the moon, carrying astronauts James Lovell, John Swaggart, and Fred Hasse. The mission launched at 2.13 p.m. on April 11th, 1970. About three hours after launch, the mission is set for its trajectory to the moon. There is a command module called the Odyssey and a lunar module called Aquarius. On the April 13th at about 10 p.m., the second oxygen tank explodes. This causes issues with the other oxygen tanks. The crew contacts Cape Canaveral shortly after the incident with the famous line, Houston, we've had a problem. So that was the original voice message. What it has become today is Houston, we have a problem. After about three hours, all of the oxygen stores are gone and there was a loss of water, electricity, and the propulsion system. Houston and the crew began to work on a plan for safe reentry to Earth that includes closing off the command module and reconfiguring the lunar module. The crew rations supplies and power in order to safely return to Earth. With careful calculations, they are about to change the course of their trajectory and reposition the spacecraft toward Earth on April 14th. On April 17th, the crew of Apollo 13 has a successfully splashed down in the Pacific Ocean near the island of Samoa with all of the crew surviving. Following the flight, the crew planned to write a book, but they all left NASA without starting it. After Lovell retired in 1991, he was approached by journalist Jeffrey Kluger about writing a nonfiction account of the mission. The resultant book, Lost Moon, The Perilous Voyage of Apollo 13, was published in 1994. The next year, in 1995, a film adaptation of the book, Apollo 13, was released, directed by Ron Howard, starring Tom Hanks, uh, 
James Lovell, Krantz, and other principals have stated that this film depicted the events of the mission fairly accurately. Uh, given that some uh, dramatic license was taken. Two expressions from the film made their way into the American lexicon. One, Houston, we have a problem. And two, failure is not an option. So people would start to use this in uh, both of these in uh, daily uh, conversation. Um, so here is a, uh, the trailer uh, for the Apollo 13 movie uh, starring uh, Tom Hanks. So take a look at that video clip. Okay, so one of the significant news events of the 70s, uh, as like most things in popular culture, uh, started earlier. Um, this particular thing uh, about uh, Vietnam and protesting the Vietnam War had actually started in the 60s, but it uh, continued on through until the end of the war in 1973. So one of the major events uh, related to the protesting of the Vietnam War was an incident that happened at Kent State University in Ohio. So this is the backdrop uh, to the story. In uh, April of 1970, uh, President Nixon orders a secret invasion of Cambodia by the United States and South Vietnamese troops. News of the invasion reaches the United States and further fuels anti-war sentiments. People stage massive protests against the United States' involvement in Cambodia. Several students are shot and killed by the National Guard at anti-war protests at Kent State University and Jackson State University. Soon after, President Nixon withdraws forces from Cambodia. So this uh, shooting of students uh, demonstrating uh, takes an already uh, unpopular war, and it becomes so uh, much protested, not just by students, but by even wealthy uh, financial institutions, uh, people in power that eventually America pulls out of the, the conflict in Vietnam. Okay, so the article goes on to say the Kent State shootings, also known as the May 4 math massacre of the Kent State uh, massacre and the killings of four and wounding of nine other um, armed Kent State University students by the Ohio National Guard uh, in Ohio, in Kent, Ohio, 40 miles south of Cleveland. The killings took place during a peace rally opposing the expanding involvement of the Vietnam War into neutral Cambodia by the United States military forces as well as protesting the National Guard presence on the campus. The incident marked the first time that a student had been killed in an anti-war gathering in United States history. The fatal shootings triggered immediate and massive outrage on campuses around the country. More than 4 million students participated in organized walkouts at hundreds of universities, colleges, and high schools. The largest student strike in the history of the United States at that time. The 
student strike of 1970 further affected public opinion at an already socially contentious time over the role of the United States in the Vietnam War. So the war had been going on for mm, five or six years now. Uh, the best known popular culture response to the deaths at Kent State was the protest song, Ohio, written by Neil Young for Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They promptly recorded the song and previewed uh, discs were rushed to major radio stations. Although the group already had a hit song, Teach Your Children on the charts at the time. Within two and a half weeks of Kent State shootings, Ohio was receiving national airplay. The B-side of the signal released was Stephen Still's anti-Vietnam War anthem, Find the Cost of Freedom. America finally withdraws from Vietnam in 1973. So let's take a listen to uh, Ohio by Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, music of the 70s. So 1970 uh, music continues to make a significant impact with the largest ever rock festival held on the Isle of Wight in England, a uh, copy of the Woodstock Festival, but a lot better organized. The Beatles uh, have disbanded. They officially break up in April 1970 when uh, Paul McCartney uh, publicly states that he's leaving the band. However, their last album, Let It Be, uh, is released uh, a month later. Jimi Hendrix dies of a drug overdose in London. Janis Joplin dies in a cheap motel from a drug overdose. Simon and Garfunkel released their final album, Bridge Over Troubled Water. The title track uh, won a Grammy uh, for the song uh, a year uh, of the same year. Um, you might hear the Beatles' uh, Let It Be, uh, Jackson 5, uh, Michael Jackson's uh, early uh, group with his brothers, uh, with their two uh, hit songs, ABC and I Want You Back, and uh, Edwin Starr with a song called War. So this is uh, from an article from Rolling Stone magazine, uh, 20 songs that define the 70s, uh, 20 songs that were inescapable during the Nixon era, including Marvin Gaye, Elton John, Carol King, and more by Keith Harris and Richard Gere. Pondering pop history from a, a generation or two away, it's easy to forget what things actually sounded like as Western culture worked itself into a complicated cultural froth, the early 70s reflected those complexities in its hit parade with music that was entertaining and for better or worse, unavoidable. Which is to say that the tunes on this list constitute much of the DNA of everyone alive at the time. Radio still mattered more than TV, and our seemingly endless culture wars were only beginning. 
uh, new constituencies were arising and pop had even started reflecting on its own history. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And so, to the best of our recollections, here's the greatest music you couldn't avoid hearing in the early 70s. Uh, James Brown, his song called Get Up. The Jackson Five with uh, I'll Be There. So when the Jacksons followed their 1969 debut, I Want You Back, um, with the equally high energy delights ABC and the love you save uh, seemed boundless. Uh, a new font of Motown optimism for a new decade. But it was the brothers' first ballad that would become the label's all-time bestseller, retaining the title for more than a decade. No preteen has ever sung as credibly about eternal devotion as Michael Jackson. His performance beginning with a calm, childlike sweetness that he ruptures boldly with an adult grasp. And when he erupts into a climactic shout of, just look over your shoulders, honey, that echoes the four tops, reach out, I'll be there. He's glancing back at the past to suggest greatness to come, uh, which he does. George Harrison of the Beatles breaks out on his own. He uh, creates his own song called My Sweet Lord. Um, after the Beatles anointed the first half of 1970s with their sweetly spiritual Let It Be, George Harrison aimed for the heavens in December with My Sweet Lord. Harrison combined the Hare Krishna mantra, the Christian hymn, Oh Happy Day, uh, some bluesy slide guitar, uh, Phil Spector's wall of sound and the chiffons, He's so fine, at least according to a U.S. state district court, into an, an amazing one-size-fits-all example of pop perfection. Or as John Lennon said in a Rolling Stone interview, quote, every time I put the radio on, it's, oh, my Lord, I'm beginning to think there must be a God. Derek and the Dominoes with Layla, coming from guitar hero Eric Clapton, uh, hopped from supergroup to supergroup uh, until he went out on his own uh, with uh, Layla. I saw American band called The Grateful Dead uh, touring the circuit of all the music festivals. Um, the drift of popularity from AM to FM radio during the 70s eroded the mass audience upon which pop hits depend. Hippies and fellow travelers could increasingly be found glued to freeform FM stations and no underground hit glowed quite as mysteriously as the opening track on Workman's Dead, a declaration of the Grateful Dead's newly expert harmonizing. The suggestion to come to hear Uncle John's band, according to lyricist Robert Hunter, is nothing less than the coaxing and cajoling of the forces of generational unity. The song is one of the band's best known and is included in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's 500 songs that shaped rock and roll. In 2001, it was named 
321st in the Songs of the Century project list. You would also hear uh, from Lynn Anderson, kind of a one-hit wonder, called Rose Garden. In the 70s, country music burst into mainstream like never before, and women were at the forefront. You couldn't help but overhear Loretta Lynn's coal miner's daughter and Dolly Parton's Jolene were redefining Nashville. But the biggest country crossover hit of its day, written by the country soul great Joel South, came along at a time when, as Lynn Anderson herself put it, people were trying to recover from the Vietnam years and it perfectly captured the spirit of the time, an optimistic anthem that also served as a splash of cold water to the face. Janis Joplin, although she had passed away, uh, her songs were still being released, uh, with uh, me and Bobby McGee, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, uh, FM radio in the 70s celebrated music at great length, great breadth, and great depth. And no band commanded those airwaves quite like Led Zeppelin. Stairway is long, eight minutes and two seconds. Stairway is broad as the song builds. For sure, Zeppelin could and did get heavier and wilder than Stairway, but never got more Zeppelinier. Carol King, as a teen, Carol King was already writing classic hits like Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow at New York's storied Brill Building, but her own recording career only started after she relocated to Laurel Canyon in California at the end of the 60s. Tony Stern's lyrics, based on a recently ended relationship with James Taylor, express an adult perspective on breaking up that avoids blame and bitterness. King's wise and weary vocal can make you forget she hadn't yet turned 30, and the way Curtis Amy Soprano sax solo peters out before the final chorus underlines the song's message of how love can be, just be uh, unexpectedly vanish. And that was Carol King's song called It's Too Late. So next we have the Rolling Stones, Brown Sugar, the Stones typically met the utopian of the 60s with either a wink or a snarl, but finally they entered a decade just as gruff and nasty as they were before. Ostensibly a party jam, Brown Sugar traces rock and roll by the extension of wealth and fame to slavery and its plunder of black lives and black culture and yet refuses to be apologetic about it. Brown Sugar is Walter Benjamin's story about every document of culture also being a document of barbarism. A group called Sly and the Family Stone sings a song called Family Affair. Sly Stone's final uh, chart-topping single was uh, most successful of his career was a dark spear masterpiece of submarine uh, rhythm and blues. The song's lyrics uh, talk about everything from a Woodstock hangover to fear of the Black Panthers. But as Sly told Rolling Stone upon its release, songs about a family affair, whether it's a result of a genetic process 
or a situation in the environment. Al Green, let's stay together. As the soul music evolved in the 70s, the dancing in the street of the civil rights era gave way to the sound of making out behind closed doors. No singer combined down-home grit with boudoir uh, suavete as effortlessly as Al Green. The staple singers, I'll Take You Home, uh, is uh, five minutes of uh, gospel soul uh, magnificence uh, made communally uplifting black church music safe for white listeners. Its Muscle Shoals arrangement, meanwhile, tapped deeply, if perhaps a little too nonchalantly, into early Jamaican reggae. People thought I'll Take You There was the devil's music because people were dancing to it. Elton John's Rocket Man. Uh, your song, Levon, Tiny Dancer, Daniel, uh, Honky Cat, Crocodile Rock. Elton John owned the early 70s and most of the rest of the decade, but Rocket Man was his most ambitious mega hit. Stevie Wonder. Fingertips Part 2 became Stevie Wonder's first number one hit when the soul wonder kind was just 13 years old. But despite a dynamic string of 60 singles, he didn't top the charts again for nearly a decade. Uh, as with Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, Superstition was the sound of a Motown artist taking control of his career. And Stevie's hit was just as political in its own subtle way as Marvin's channeling the mood of skepticism prevailing in the U.S. at the time. So here's a video up to date uh, today. It's called uh, Stevie Wonder Carpool Karaoke. I'll uh, take a look at it. So in order to really understand the subtext of the, uh, the visual here, uh, Stevie Wonder is a blind uh, musician. Okay, so next on our list is Helen Rady. I am woman. Helen Rady, uh, delivered her catchy feminist anthem, I Am Woman, with cunning restraint. As a performer, Reddy was more than familiar uh, with male imbecility. She'd been down there on the floor, and this song, whose strong, invincible hook came to her in a dream, was payback. A collective roar often foolishly mistaken for egotistic bravada. I was able to connect with all kinds of women, Reddy would write. Women who had been initially turned off by some of the more strident feminist voices or women who believed they were already liberated. So this became the one of the theme songs of the uh, woman's uh, liberation movement in the 70s. Todd Rundgren, Hello, It's Me, was inspired musically by Jimmy Smith, organ intro into a recording when Johnny comes marching home. With an ill-fated high school romance uh, supplying the one-sided phone conversation uh, Todd Rundgren elevated the blandness of the breakup to high pop realism. Never heard of this one called Hot Butter Popcorn. It looks like it's a German-American uh, composition. 
that was a combination of a Bach in uh, improvisation uh, and music to Moog by. It took off in Paris, uh, disco, and went on to aspire uh, Muse and Crazy Fog. Marvin Gaye, Let's Get It On, was a stirring anthem of political consciousness, making a new stage for Marvin Gaye's career in rhythm and blues. The 70s would be a steamy decade after all, and no one explored the artistry of seduction with such a versatile sense of humor as Marvin Gaye. And the song from The Suite, I think they're a British bland band called The Ballroom Blitz. So uh, this influenced a group coming up in America called uh, The Ramones. And they debuted uh, back in 1976. So by the late 70s, most major US cities had thriving disco club scenes and DJs would mix dance records at clubs such as Studio 54 in Manhattan, a uh, venue popular among celebrities. Disco was the last popular music movement driven by the baby boom generation, peaking in popularity during the mid-1970s. Disco started as a mixture of music from uh, venues popular with African Americans, Hispanic and Latino Americans, Italian Americans, and gay men in Philadelphia and New York City during the late 60s and early 70s. Disco can be seen as a reaction by the 60s counterculture to both the dominance of rock music and the stagnation of dance music at the time. Several dance styles were developed during the period of disco's popularity in the United States, including the bump and the hustle. Rolling Stone magazine states, the movie Saturday Night Fever is the high water mark of the disco movement. And the Bee Gees staying alive is the high water mark of Saturday Night Fever. The band's most iconic hit is forever associated with disco's biggest cultural moment. And it's probably one of the first songs that comes to mind when anyone thinks of disco in general. So let's take a listen here to the Bee Gees uh, staying alive from the movie Saturday Night Fever. Okay, so let's talk about uh, 20 things every cool kid uh, growing up in the 1970s owned. This is from an article from bestlifeonline.com. So uh, one of the cool things was called a sweatband. And uh, this was worn around the head mostly of, uh, started with tennis players, but uh, became a fashion in the 70s. So sweatbands, if they're good enough for Joan McEnroe, they're good enough for a 15 year old kid in gym class. Even if you weren't especially athletic, wearing one of these things would instantly make you look like you were part of an intense training montage, Rocky II style. We also see it in the Rocky movies uh, as well, and Rambo. Uh, the next style is called uh, an Afro. And 
no one was uh, more envied than kids who could grow a glorious afro. Those who sported them liked to image uh, and imagine that they uh, made them look like Sly Stone or Diana Ross. Uh, sometimes it worked, other times it just made you look like Rob Ross. So who is Rob Ross? Rob Ross was an American painter, art instructor, and television host. He was the creator and host of The Joy of Painting, an instructional television program that aired uh, in the 80s uh, to the early 90s on PBS in the United States and in Canada. With his distinctive hair, gentle voice, and signature expressions such as happy little trees, he was an enduring icon. Even 25 years after his death, his popularity, not only with viewers who remain, uh, remember him fondly, but also with kids who weren't born when his show was originally on the air. What many people don't know is that one of the biggest influences on Ross's persona and painting technique was the 20 years he spent in the Air Force, especially his time as a drill sergeant. So the drill sergeant is the guy that you meet your first day in the military. And he's the guy that yells at you for being late, and tells you to do push-ups and can't really imagine this guy as a uh, drill sergeant, but nevertheless, he was stationed in um, Alaska. And uh, during his lunch break from being a drill instructor, he would go home and he would paint uh, pictures of the surrounding uh, landscapes in Alaska. And he would bring them back to work and he started selling them. And eventually he finds out that he can make more money selling his artwork than he can being in the Air Force. So he leaves the Air Force and uh, he gets a uh, television program instructing people how to paint. It's a very simplified approach to painting. Uh, people would love to watch his, uh, his shows, a very soothing manner and voice. So let's take a look at uh, uh, Bob Ross Mimix, Happy Little Clouds from uh, PBS. Another fashion that was big in the 70s was bell-bottom pants. Everything about these wide-legged pants is confusing. We're trying to make our calves look especially muscular. Did somebody think if only there was a way to combine super tight pants with a tripping hazard? A lot of misguided adults thought bell bottoms looked stylish in the 70s. And cool kids have historically always been eager to imitate adults' worst instincts. So obviously, we had these things. And actually, bell-bottom pants comes from the Navy. Uh, another fashion was called uh, moon boots, created by an Italian boot maker who was obsessed with the moon landings. And these uh, boots, which were clearly designed to make us all feel like NASA astronauts, were the most iconic footwear, footwear trend in the 70s. Moon boots were so popular that in 2000, the Louvre Museum even included them 
in their collection of the 20th century's most significant design symbols. We also had something called a Nerf football. This wildly popular foam ball was sold to kids, or rather their parents, as the world's first official indoor ball, which made it sound completely accident proof. You can't damage lamps or break windows, the ads promise. You can't hurt babies or old people. Yes, this was the 70s, when our product probably wouldn't kill anyone, was considered a marketing strategy. And for the record, you could totally damage a lamp with one of these things. And school teachers are forever taking these away from kids in the hallway. Another uh, item is called the chopper bike with a banana seat, kind of taken from the motorcycle uh, movies. Uh, you didn't even have to pop a wheelie when you owned a chopper bike. All you had to do was sit there, tapping your finger on the handlebars like you were revving a throttle and you even looked like evil Knievel getting ready to jump over a canyon. I'm going to talk about evil Knievel in a few minutes. Another trend was something called tube socks. Girl holding generic backpack wearing black shorts and tube socks with tennis shoes standing on a vacant street. We've on, we're honestly perplexed why tube socks, particularly socks with colorful stripes on the top that stretched all the way up to your knees were considered attractive. According to Smithsonian, 70s stars like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Dr. J. Irving, and Farrah Fawcett were responsible for bringing this look in vogue. Okay, so that's it for our items that uh, kids own that people thought were cool back in the 70s. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Evil Knievel. This is from an article from biography.com. Evil Knievel was an American daredevil who attempted more than 75 ramp-to-ramp -ramp motorcycle jumps. Some of the more famous include flying over the fountain at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, jumping over buses at London's Wembley Stadium, and an aborted a trip across Snake River Canyon in a steam-powered vehicle. Starting from humble and somewhat troubled beginnings, Knievel became an international icon in the 70s for his incredible motorcycle stunts. 1966, Knievel had moved to Moses Lake, Washington, where he worked in a motorcycle shop. To help drum up business, he announced that he would jump a motorcycle 40 feet over parked cars and a box of rattlesnakes, then continuing on past a caged cougar. In front of a thousand people, he made the jump but fell short, landing on the rattlesnakes. The crowd went wild, and a new career was born for Knievel. Snake River Canyon. In his quest to find more daring and dangerous jumps, Knievel asked the Department of Interior if he could jump over the Grand Canyon. His request was denied. Undaunted, he set his sights on Idaho's Snake River Canyon. In 1972, Knievel announced that he had leased a parcel of private land, hired a film crew, 
and an aeronautical engineer. He spent over two years in testing and development, and by the fall of 1974, he was ready. He landed himself a cover on Sports Illustrated that came out only a few days before the September 8, 1974 jump. His vehicle, dubbed Sky Cycle, was a steam-powered machine that resembled a re-entry vehicle more than a motorcycle. Here is a video of his jump, uh, which, by the way, uh, he fails and uh, almost uh, dies in the uh, accident. Okay, so that's a little bit on Evil Knievel. Okay, so let's talk about the movies uh, during the 70s. And uh, this is from AARP.org Entertainment website. So one of the popular films was called MASH. And it was a 1970 American black comedy war film based on Richard Hooker's uh, 1968 novel, MASH. It's about uh, three army doctors, and it was one of the biggest films of the year uh, uh, in the early uh, 70s for 20, 20th Century Fox. So the film depicts a unit of medical personnel st uh, stationed at a mobile army surgical hospital MASH during the Korean War. Although the Korean War is the film's storyline setting, the subtext is the Vietnam War, a current event at the time the film was made. Doonesbury cartoonist creator Gary Trudeau, who saw the film in college, said MASH was perfect for the times, a cacophony of American culture was brilliantly reproduced on screen. The film won the Grand Prix du Festival International de Films. Uh, it had won many awards. Uh, it was added to the National Film Registry of the College uh, Library of Congress. Uh, being deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant and recommended for preservation. The film inspired the TV series MASH, which ran from 1972 to 1983. So let's take a look at a clip uh, from the movie MASH. Uh, the trailer. Another Vietnam movie uh, was Apocalypse Now, released uh, later in the 70s. And the making of this Vietnam epic was nearly as chaotic as the war itself. There were a lot of problems with the filming and the actors, people getting fired, people getting sick. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they uh, pull it off. It was uh, nominated for eight uh, Oscars and uh, included some of the top uh, performers of the day, Robert Duvall, um, Martin uh, Sheen, and uh, Marlon Brando, uh, and grossed about $150 million worldwide. Uh, Animal House, the late 70s, it was a gross out, uh, humorous movie uh, with uh, Kevin Bacon and John Bellucci. Although by today's standards, the cafeteria food fight looks about as tame as high tea. Uh, but uh, John Bellucci's film is uh, starring as Bluto's best line, 
says, uh, seven years of college down the drain. Uh, Kevin Bacon, it was one of his first uh, movies that kind of put him on the map. And it was the first film produced by National Lampoon, which was a snarky humor magazine that all but defined funny for much of the decade. Annie Hall, uh, directed and produced by Woody Allen, who's pretty radioactive right now, but back in the 70s, he was the embodiment of nerd chic and became the template for all sophisticated romantic comedies to follow, starring Diane Keaton, who sparked a brief fashion craze with her eccentric vest outfits. Won the Best uh, Actress Oscar, Allen won Best Director and Best Screenplay, and the film won Best Picture. American Graffiti, 1973. Uh, before he started blowing up uh, Death Stars, George Lucas served up this slice of nostalgia. A loosely plotted but utterly engaging coming of age story set in the early 1960s in Modesto, California where a bunch of recent high school graduates spend the summer hanging out at Mel's Diner as they prepare to leave for college, find a job, or ship out to Vietnam. The cast list reads like a who's who of soon-to-be 70s stars. Ron Howard, Richard Dreyfus, Cindy Williams, Mackenzie Phillips, Harrison Ford, and Suzanne Summers. So let's take a look at a uh, video from American Graffiti. Of course, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, big hit, Ray Bradbury's uh, movie. And this also helped uh, uh, Richard Dreyfuss become one of the decade's biggest stars. Another kind of spacey movie, Star Wars, with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Uh, they won many awards for this movie as well and started a whole trilogy that lasted for years. We talked about Jaws, uh, another Spielberg uh, film. That was in 1975. Uh, taxi Driver, uh, put uh, Robert De Niro on the map as uh, the decade's uh, preeminent method actor. Um, again, uh, relating back to Vietnam, uh, someone coming back from the war, disillusioned. And finally, maybe number one for the whole decade was uh, The Godfather. This isn't merely the greatest movie of the 70s, it's the greatest of all time, at least according to Time Magazine. The American Film Institute and a slew of other best film lists. Still Francis Ford Coppola's Mafia Family Saga, which won three Oscars, including Best Picture, couldn't have been made in any other decade. So again, the big heavy hitters in the movie, Al Pacino, James Caan, Robert Duvall, Diane Keaton, and Marlon Brando. So that's a quick look at uh, some of the movies that uh, made its way during the 1970s. Okay, so we can't really talk about uh, the 1970s without talking about uh, the Vietnam War in pop culture from an article from ABC Net Australia by Patrick Wood. And 
few conflicts have spawned as many film, music, and TV spin-offs as the Vietnam War, and few have divided the pop culture world as much. Long before Robin Williams shouted good morning Vietnam into the microphone, the pop culture industry had latched onto the Vietnam War to shape a compelling, if conflicting, narrative. Films, music, TV shows, mostly coming out of, the, out of the United States, have tackled the war in different ways and told stories that in the years since may have shaped our perception of history. Films like Apocalypse Now, Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July, have become cultural icons. Clarence Clearwater's revival Fortunate Son and Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA have found a similar spot in the music canon. In the early days of Western involvement in the Vietnam War, the champions of film and music were notably split on how to spin the conflict. Hollywood has made a significant effort to portray America's Vietnam experience. Professor of Cinema Studies David Desser wrote in Inventing Vietnam, The War in Film and Television. Yet the films hardly present a unified, coherent vision. If we take these films as a group, we find contradictions and ambiguities throughout. While many individual works are similar, conflicted in what they are trying to say about the Vietnam War and America's involvement in it, such as John Wayne's The Green Beret in 1968 was a staunchly pro-US military film it told the story of a jur journalist who was cynical about the war, but came to support it after traveling to Vietnam with U.S. troops. The film was released at the height of the war and was panned by critics, partly for its quality, but also because of reports of heavy U.S. government involvement in the editing and production of the film. Its pro-military message was in stark contrast to the growing public protest back home in the U.S. that musicians were starting to tap into. The 1967 song, I Feel Like I'm Fixing to Die Rag, was satirical and anti-war and received widespread attention after it was performed at the now famous 1969 Woodstock Festival. Fortunate Son wasn't explicit in its criticism of the war, but it tapped into the counterculture that was starting to be seen in the pop culture material of the time. And while Sergeant Barry Sadler's Ballad of the Green Beret, 1966, was a pro-military song, it became the outlier in the collection of songs from the era. The aftermath of the war, when the war officially ended in 1975, there was not a rush from Hollywood to create the epic dramas many might associate with the conflict. Instead, many productions dealt with the issue by proxy and focused on the effect the war had on returning soldiers. Taxi Driver and the Deer Hunter both looked at former soldiers who were prone to violence and were struggling to return to normal life after the war. After these two films were met with critical acclaim and Academy Award nominations, the tortured Vietnam vet became a stock character in many films over the years, including Jack Knives, Forrest Gump, and Dead President. 
it was pretty accurate and compelling uh, insight into the lives, minds, and bodies, as it turned out, of the young men who went off to fight and came back to a society that did not value or respect their service as it had their fathers in World War II and grandfathers in World War I, he said. Another significant change is the voting age is lowered to 18 in the United States as a result of the Vietnam War. So young kids are being drafted at the age of 18, but they can't drink a beer or vote. So people protested that and eventually the uh, voting age and drinking ages were lowered to 18 in the United States. Okay, so kind of a uh, conclusion of the 1970s from AmericanHeritage.com. How the 70s changed America by Nicholas Lehman. He says, the loser decade that at first seemed nothing more than a breathing space between the high drama of the 1960s and whatever was coming next is beginning to reveal itself as a bigger time than we thought. The underestimation of the 70s importance, especially during the early years of the decade, is easy to forgive because the character of the 70s was substantially shaped at first by spillover from the 60s. Such 60s events as the killing of student protesters at Kent State and Orangeburg, the original Earth Day, the invasion of Cambodia, and a large portion of the war in Vietnam took place in the 70s. Although 60s radicals, cultural and political, spent the early 70s loudly bemoaning the end of the revolution, what was in fact going on was the working of the phenomena of the 60s into mainstream American life. In New Orleans, my hometown, the hippie movement peaked in 1972 or 73. Long hair, crash pads, head shop, psychedelic posters, underground newspapers, and other summer of love inspired institutions had been unknown there during the real summer of love, which was in 1967. It took even longer until the middle or late 70s for those aspects of hippie life that have endured to catch on with the general public. All over the country, the likelihood of an average citizen would wear longish hair and uh, openly live with a lover before marriage was probably greater in 1980s than it was in the 70s. The 60s preoccupied with self-discovery became a mass phenomena only in the 70s though homebrew psychological therapies like EST. In politics, the impact of black enfranchisement that took place in the 60s barely began to be felt until the mid to late 70s. The tremendously influential feminist and gay liberation movement were, at the dawn of the 70s, barely underway in Manhattan, their headquarters, and certainly hadn't begun to spread across the whole country. The 60s took a long time for America to digest. The process went throughout the 70s and even into the 80s. For 30 years, ever since the efforts of World War II on the economy had begun to kick in, the average American standard of living had been rising, 
to a remarkable extent. As the economy grew, induces like home ownership, automobile ownership, access to higher education, got up to levels unknown anywhere else in the world, and in the United States could possibly claim to have provided a better life materially for its working class than any society ever had. That ended with the OPEC embargo. Oil embargo, 1973-74. During the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, imposed an embargo against the United States in retaliation for the United States' decision to resupply the Israeli military and to gain leverage in post-war peace negotiations. The OPEC oil embargo was an event where the 12 countries that made up OPEC stopped selling oil to the United States. The embargo sent gas prices through the roof. Between 1973 and 1974, prices more than quadrupled. The embargo contributed to stagflation. Stagflation is persistent high inflation combined with high unemployment and a stagnant demand in the country's economy. Nicholas Lehman continues, the embargo on the other hand was a non-video friendly economic story and hence difficult to get hooked on. It pertained to two subcultures that were completely mysterious to most Americans, the oil industry and the Arab world. And it seemed at first to be merely an episode in the ongoing hostilities between Israel and its neighbors. But in retrospect, it changed everything, much more than Watergate did. Most important of all, the embargo now appears to have been the pivotal moment at which the <coughs> mass upward economic mobility of American society ended, perhaps forever. The average weekly earnings adjusted for inflation peaked in 1973. Productivity, that is, economic output per man hour, abruptly stopped growing. The nearly universal assumption in the post-World War II United States was that children could do better than their parents. Upward mobility wasn't just a characteristic of the national culture, it was the defining characteristic. And as it slowly began to sink in that everybody wasn't going to be moving forward together anymore, the country became more fragmented, more internal, internally rivalrous, and less sure of its mythology. As the country became more fragmented, so was its essential social unit, the family. In 1965, only 14% of the population was single. By 1979, the figure had risen to 20. The divorce rate went from uh, two per thousand in 1965 to five per thousand in 1979. The percentage of birth out of wedlock was five in 1960 and 16 in 1978. Uh, the likelihood that married women with children would work doubled between the mid 60s and the late 70s. These changes took place for a variety of reasons. Feminism, uh, spread across the country of the 60s youth culture, rejecting the traditional mores. But what they added up 
two was that the nuclear family consisting of a working husband and a non-working wife, both in their first marriage and their, uh, and their children, ceased to be so dominant a type of American household during the 70s. Also, people became more likely to organize themselves into communities based on their family status so that the unmarried often lived in single apartment complexes and retirees in senior citizen developments. The overall effect was one of much greater personal freedom, which meant, as it always does, less social cohesion. Tom Wolfe's moniker for the 70s, the Me Decade, caught on because it was probably true and that the country had placed relatively more emphasis on individual happiness and relatively less on loyalty to the family and the nation. So that's kind of a quick wrap up of what the 70s was uh, like. Um, that uh, will conclude our uh, lesson for today. Just as we go out, um, there were lots of uh, little technology gadgets that were starting to appear uh, to the general public uh, in terms of technology, computers, uh, music, uh, type instruments and so forth. So uh, we'll take a look at those on our way out of uh, this video today. But it's important to remember that um, those devices initially were uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, the uh, general uh, public would take hmm, five years or more for prices to go down to where these uh, technology, things like Walkman and personal computers were affordable for the uh, general public. So uh, a, a quick uh, end note uh, on technology. My uh, younger brother told me a story that uh, he, after graduating from high school, Five years later, he gets together with some friends from his old high school days, and one of the guys in the group uh, ha was pretty smart and uh, had gone to work for some science uh, companies. And this was back in the day of the uh, eight-track uh, uh, recorder. So his friend uh, told him that they were working on this new uh, music player that was uh, would come in the form of a disc, and uh, it would be played with a, a laser light. And everyone was astonished. You couldn't believe it. It was probably 10, 15 years later that the CD-ROM uh, did come uh, to the general public. So it just goes to show that uh, companies, uh, governments, uh, businesses are uh, working on these uh, technological devices that uh, we have today uh, back 10, 15 years before they're ever entered into the public. So what we have today is probably 20 years late. So who knows what's gonna happen in 20 years from now with these new inventions in technology. But nevertheless, 70s kind of starts the ball rolling uh, for technology in terms of computer and uh, personal uh, music devices. So we'll take a look at those on our way out. Um, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.